So hello, welcome to everybody who's joining us now. Bonjour à tous. So welcome everyone. Bonjour et bienvenue à tous. Bonjour. My name is Lise Brun. I'm a program officer with the Canadian Association of Research Libraries, CARL. And before we do get started, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the Indigenous land on which I am situated. Although you probably know that the CARL office is located in Ottawa, I am uh, working here in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the trees of peace and friendship, which the Mi'kmaq, Willis Takiek, and Passamaquoddy people first signed with the British Crown in 1726. And I do wish to further acknowledge the collective role we all have in upholding these treaties. We are all treaty people. On behalf of Carl, I wish to thank you for joining us today. And I hope you'll find this session interesting. I hope that our institutional open access policy template and toolkit prove useful to you in the future in your campus open access work. You will have the opportunity to ask questions and provide comments and feedback. We know that we have a number of people on the line who have produced uh, or led the work of open access policies at your institutions. So we'd love to hear from you later on. Alors, bienvenue aux francophones qui sont avec nous. Uh, nous vous rappelons qu'il nous ferait plaisir de recevoir vos questions et vos commentaires en français. So as program officer at CARL, I work primarily with CARL's high-level advancing research committee, which we typically call ARC. And this is the group responsible for advising CARL and leading initiatives and projects related to open access and scholarly communications, among other things. Um, I will mention that prior to this, I worked for nearly a decade as an academic librarian at a small, primarily undergraduate institution. And this was up until very shortly after the launch of the Tri-Agency Policy on Publications. So I've had quite a bit of firsthand experience engaging in discussions on open access with faculty, students, and administration. And this is something I brought to the table when I joined Joy Kirchner in developing this toolkit. So in a second, I'll let Joy introduce herself. But before that, I do want to take a minute to thank Joy for her absolute devotion to this project. <laughs> it has taken a few years to complete. Uh, so it's been quite uh, a work of love and uh, uh, involvement. Uh, <laughs> Carl's very lucky that Joy offered to lead this effort as she's had a lot of experience nurturing open access policy discussions on several different campuses, most recently and currently at, at York University which has passed an open access policy in 2019. So the toolkit really reflects Joya's commitment and appreciation for the journey, for the process. And I'm pleased to say that she'll be sharing some of this passion in our presentation today. So on that note, I hand it over to you, Joy. Oh, thank you, Liz. That was a, a really lovely uh, introduction. Thank you very much, I'm, I'm touched. Um, but we are also joined today by to others, uh, and I'm, I'm delighted to introduce um, Mark Robertson. Maybe you can wave Mark, uh, who's the university librarian at Brock University. And um, maybe when you share the slide deck, I'm not sure if you're sharing it now, uh, Lise, but you'll see a link to BIOS there, and also Diane Save. So Diane, um, very warm welcome. You have a very interesting journey to share uh, with us from the University of Montreal. So delighted that you're joining us as well. And I'm also very aware that there are many experienced people on this call who come from Skull Calm and other, and, and other backgrounds like that. So I hope you'll share your wisdom with us too. Uh, we have a perspective, but I know that uh, there's a, a great group of people who uh, have uh, a lot of experience in this area. So we really invite you to share your experience as well. Um, I'm just going to uh, move to our slide three. Uh, uh, thank you, Lise. And just to cover off what we're going to uh, share today, uh, we're going to begin just with an introduction of op why open access policies, uh, framing our process for the toolkit and why it developed the way it did, um, the importance of context uh, setting uh, in our evolution of the toolkit and this is based on our experience as well and through dialogue with many of the folks that contributed their input to the toolkit. Our institutional contexts are critically important 
um, depending where you are uh, and uh, the, the values and the context of your institution, your policy may look very different from one or another. So we hope you see that our policy toolkit uh, reflects some of that thinking. And then uh, we're going to end with some lessons learned um, from three of us who are able to join and maybe some of you will share some of your lessons learned too and some surprises and things that, that we would like to impart to you as, as part of uh, the process of this journey. So I'm going to uh, now ask Elise to go to the next slide and I'm sure maybe you've had a chance to look at this toolkit. Um, it actually took us a long time um, to actually conceptualize how we should put this together. We were aware of many other tools out there like the, the very well-known Harvard um, Open Access Policy um, Toolkit resource. Uh, and others. And so we didn't want to duplicate those efforts. Um, but I know that any of us who've been on the journey of advancing an open access policy knows that you look at many, many policies and you're looking at many, many documents. So we hoped that this toolkit would distill <laughs> much of uh, the research that inevitably all of us do as we're working through our own journey and uh, helps you to see, and we're very interested in your feedback, uh, how to quickly get to what you need to do to begin the journey. So this toolkit is very much, um, as in this first iteration, is uh, a beginning of the journey open access toolkit. Um, and Lisa's gonna talk a little bit more about some of that context, uh, but just to introduce you to some elements of, of the toolkit. Here. So you'll see that we start with just a sections of, of the toolkit so that you could quickly see what we had seen in many, many different policies are the uh, typical uh, sections of a policy. Um, if you look at York, so uh, our policy looks a little bit different because we had to align with the way policies were created at our institution and that may be true for you. But in any case, the elements are uh, similar wherever you are in, in most policies that we've seen. Um, if you look at some of the other sections of a typical policy, we go into more detail. Um, we um, have also put together a list of key principles. Uh, and I'm looking at Mark because he helped to really help us think through some of the headers to use for this section in particular. Uh, what we noticed were some key principles that were common to Canadian institutional policies and other policies. Um, the section of beginning the journey was really to give you a quick heads up of all the things that you might want to think about before you, you start the policy. Um, some of this comes up in our lessons learned as well, alignment with institutional values and other documentation uh, as you move through forward with the journey. And then some lessons learned, which are really interviews with um, a number of Canadians who have uh, Canadian institutions that have advanced open access policies, and then some other examples and resources. Um, so we encourage you to look at this entire toolkit. It is the first version, and we're really, really curious to hear your feedback about what worked and what didn't, and um, what you um, would like to have seen and didn't see. Uh, so do please give us your toolkit, but uh, that, that is basically the construction of the toolkit. Um, I'm going to now move it to the next slide. Liz, and you are going to share a little wisdom with us. All right, so I'm not going to go into a lot of background on OE policies, but uh, I guess I can just tell you that these institutional policies or mandates emerged alongside other strategic efforts around OA uh, that you're likely familiar with. For example, the Budapest Declaration in 2002 and the Berlin Declaration in 2003, and of course also the emergence of funder policies. I did have a look at Peter Suber's very useful timeline of OA events, and the first OA policy within an institution that I found listed there was from January 2003, and that was at the University of Southampton's and uh, the University of Southampton, specifically their Department of Electronics and Computer Science, that adopted a policy that faculty research 
be deposited into one of their departments for open access repositories. And in terms of a university-wide policy, Subaru identifies Queensland University of Technology as having adopted the first um, campus-wide policy in September 2003. So generally speaking, an OA mandate or policy um, can be a means of expressing support for and engagement with open access. It can also be a way to increase the relevance of your institutional repository, which we also call an IR, uh, by virtue of it becoming more institutionally sanctioned and uh, tied to policy. So there are different approaches or flavors of policies, and these can range from a very gentle declaration of support that encourages making works available openly, often via the repository. And so we would categorize these as opt-in policies. Um, and then there are very, there are stronger opt-out policies where the default expectation is that faculty will deposit their work into their institution's repository. And then in those cases, an exemption must be sought if the author is unable or unwilling to comply. So one thing I'm sure my, my colleagues here will agree with, and uh, one thing you hear often is that the policy you end up with is not necessarily the one you started with. And so it's important to note that even in cases where you end up with a gentle declaration, that can still play a role uh, via the creation of a set of declared principles. And that's where the institution really openly states its support for the concept over open scholarship and the values that underlie it. So that can be a step forward for your institution in itself. So I'm going to advance here. Just a couple of notes around framing and process um, just of this toolkit and where it came from. So as I said earlier, I work with the Advancing Research Committee or ARC. And this is one of Carl's four high level committees uh, on which library directors from Canada's research intensive institutions sit. And uh, the ARC members are, has, the ARC members engaged for quite a while in significant discussion leading up to the creation of this template and toolkit. Um, and we talked about different um, benefits of having a template. Uh, there were several who expressed a real interest in having a Canadian tool specifically, and that this would be really helpful in conversations on their campuses. The, um, Absolutely, there was recognition for some excellent templates and uh, toolkits and supports available internationally. Uh, the Harvard model and uh, guide, namely among them. But the idea of a Canadian tool uh, that included um, examples of Canadian policies and also, of course, that would be bilingual, were seen as real assets of uh, creating our own toolkit. And of course, that it would be set within the Canadian scholarly context. Um, of, of course, one of the example, one of the things linked to that is the tri-agency policy and framing it in within that context, but without forgetting the evolving international context. So it was a long process. I mentioned that before. Uh, we bounced around a lot of questions about which type of model to prioritize, how broad to make the template, uh, which details to include in the toolkit. Um, and so we do see this, as Joy said, as an evolving uh, uh, document or toolkit. Uh, we do expect to make changes based on feedback. Uh, and, and certain things occurred to us a little later on, but we were able to include, for example, uh, a reference within the template itself to the importance of protecting Indigenous knowledges, how these can sometimes be at odd with the concept of openness underlying such policies and would be one example of when an exemption might be sought. So yes, I highlighted here in orange uh, that it says May 2020 version 1.0. So we do hope and expect to uh, create a either a 1.1 or a 2.0 next, depending on how much we decide to change, I guess. Um, but we do see the landscape shifting and we see it shifting more in the coming years um, as we have a lot of national and international shifts around open, open access uh, happening. We are seeing certain institutions 
who already have a policy considering broadening theirs. Um, we are seeing institutions wanting to include data and other types of outputs into their open access policies. So we do expect that uh, at some point we'll be making some changes to this and we look back, to, we look forward to all your feedback and suggestions of areas and points we might not have considered or might have missed. And on that, I will hand over to Joy, who will take us on this journey and uh, share some of her experiences. Okay, I often use this, this picture. I, I, I like it for some reason because it, it's, uh, it's a constructed path, but it also has a question mark. And I guess, you know, for most of us who are embarking on this journey, it really is um, a journey of really, um, as you're working through the journey, learning more as you go, uh, as you're advancing the conversation on campus. And the direction can course correct, and you can course correct and move all the way um, through that journey. Um, so I wanted to share with you that I was involved in three institutional open access policies, advancing them on campuses. And it's, it's always been interesting to me to see when something fails and when it doesn't and when it succeeds or how it doesn't. And I've also been involved in helping many other institutions advance their policies. So I just wanted to share with you a perspective. Um, the first open access policy I, I was involved in advancing, we had all of our ducks in a row, did our homework, had the right champions, it was a, a strongly endorsed open access institution, lots of champions. And in the 11th hour, it stalled. And it stalled for unexpected reasons. Timing was everything. Uh, a key sponsor uh, left the institution uh, in, the, in the middle of collective bargaining. And so it was stalled. And it went from a clear pathway to uh, advancing a policy to deciding that we could settle on a set of principles. Uh, the second open access institutional policy that um, I was involved in went very quickly. I was surprised how quickly it went. I was surprised that we didn't feel the need to, to do much of the background work and bring in all of our champions and get all the documentation in a row. And I was certain it would fail and it passed through Senate. And what I learned from that experience is we still had to do the work, but it happened after, <laughs> after it was passed through Senate. And, and the last one um, for me at York was um, a very interesting journey um, because we really, really had to pay attention to the Canadian context. Um, so I was very grateful to um, be involved in this project where we were really thinking specifically about the Canadian context that was very, very important at my institution. Um, we had to think very carefully about the culture. We had to think very carefully about the unionized environment and the kinds of conversations we needed to have and who to bring into our steering committee to advance the conversation. Um, and then to think, how would we want to build on this? And so each of those journeys were very, very different. They all had a very particular institutional context. Um, the first um, policy I was involved in really needed to see global examples because that was the institutional culture. They saw their place in the world in higher ed in a specific way and we needed to map to that. At the second institution, it was mapping to peers that they felt were they were competitive with. And it was a, a competitive school that needed to think in terms of a policy in that way and how you advance the conversation with, uh, with faculty and others. And, and at York, it was um, a much more grant organic uh, policy that, that as a social justice institution had to really consider um, the altruistic um, uh, values of that institution and um, ensure that that faculty felt that they could add to it and to opt out of it and that there was a possibility for each department to also advance their own policy that this was a baseline so that's that's how it was unique for me in that instance um, so all that to say to encourage all of you and in every instance that i've ever been a part of i've never regretted 
um, moving forward with advancing the conversation um, because it led somewhere. Um, so I want to share the next slide <laughs> with you, um, which is sharing three different pathways. I often use pathways as an analogy. And so if you look at the, the top one, sometimes you can't see a clear pathway. And so how you're thinking about aligning a direction or something new or something emergent is considering where your institution is at. Can you see a clear pathway? Is this very new? Or maybe this is an organic <laughs> institution that needs to be thought through in this more naturalistic, organic way. In any case, no path, every path has its own journey. And it really depends on the institutional context, the level of awareness, what's happened before. Um, I, was, I was surprised at um, the one institution that I was advancing an open access policy that we had some revolutionary people there who were um, very well known in the field in open access. And yet, sometimes when they're revolutionary folks, they also have their detractors. So we had to, we had to really navigate around um, the conversation and how to advance the work, sometimes not even using the word open access. So every journey is a little bit different. Um, in this last instance, I said to the group, the, the, the value for me is engaging in the conversation on our campus. Whether the policy fails or not, we are going to heighten awareness about the issues in, in uh, scholarly publishing and scholarly communications and all the things that we really need to have a serious conversation about on our campuses. And so from my perspective, that had the, the greatest values and dedicated attention to topics of interest that were very engaging. Um, and so I'd encourage you to think about it that way. Sometimes I, I hear folks say, let's not even begin. It's too much work. And it is a journey. I, I, you know, I think all of us will share that it's sometimes longer than you, what you think it will be. Um, but the, the journey, it's all about the journey in my mind. It's all about the conversations you have, the awareness building you have about author rights and advancing new services and directions from the conversations that you do have. Um, so that is something of the perspective that I, that I wanted to share here. And I ask Lise to um, move to the next slide. Uh, I can skip this one in a way. I was just trying to demonstrate here that sometimes you're in very established structures with full-fledged opportunities, but even then there's twists and paths in, uh, in the way um, that can somehow throw you a curveball. So I recommend to anybody just to, just to move with the flow of what is happening and being open to the conversations that you're, you're having at the institutional level and at the faculty level, because you're going to learn something from everyone. And they're going to teach you something very important about how to engage in the conversation of uh, open access. Um, next slide, please, Lise. Uh, sorry, the one before. Um, rarely do you have this kind of open pathway, pedal to the metal, clear sight vision. In every case I've been involved of or heard of, it tends to be more like the next slide, where even when you think there is a clear pathway forward, it can be slow. Conversations are slow. Socializing concepts are slow. Um, uh, correcting some mythologies about open access can take some time. And you know what, in my mind, it's all worth it. It really is. Uh, some of the, the best conversations I've had in my career have been because we've been advancing uh, open access policies. Um, so we can go to the uh, next slide, which is just some quick thoughts about thinking about um, how you align your process. And some of that is in our documentation throughout. Um, but more importantly, thinking about your institutional context. So while we have developed this toolkit and you see lessons learned, your, your journey will be unique to your institution and it will be unique to the culture at the time that you are advancing a policy and, all, and timing is everything. Sometimes the timing is right and sometimes it isn't and sometimes things can take off very, very unexpectedly because it just happens to be the right timing. But I also want um, to reference a few other things. Um, 
the importance of understanding the culture and how something will be received, and that includes at the disciplinary level, so getting the disciplinary perspective involved into your process may be important. It may be important, you know, in the same ways that you saw three different pathways to stage it in a particular way and learn as you move through the staging of the policy. So perhaps if the path isn't clear, it's about awareness building and engaging in some conversations. Or in some cases, what I've often found the best strategy is to um, go to the first place where there's traction with open access, whether it's open education or open data or whatever it is, or copyright or um, author rights. And you begin from that place and grow out. And then finally, to think about uh, the, notion, the national and global environmental context and understand how that uh, interplays in your own conversation on your campus. What are the, um, the arguments that resonate most in the, in the context, even at a disciplinary level with wherever you're going? Uh, and then just to be mindful that, that everything in scholarly communications is changing so quickly, our environment is changing so quickly, and it really is hard to keep keep track and keep up to date. Um, so you might have seen MIT relaunch their, um, their you know, after you know, decades of having an open access policy, um, again, uh, bring some resurgence to their open access policy to advance it again. And I remember talking um, to the MIT folks when they were doing this and the importance of just keeping the momentum going. Uh, for most of us who've advanced this conversation and have some distance behind us, find out that we spent a lot of time with that campus engagement. And then once the policy has stopped, the conversation stops <laughs> and it's a lot harder to bring it back. So just some quick tips about how you might think about continuing the momentum um, and being aware of other movements in the, in the global landscape that may be also impacting or bringing some new attention to this area as you move forward. Um, next slide. Uh, so in summary, I just uh, thinking about all of the institutional context. This is in the in the um, in the toolkit. Um, thinking about the group to start with and how you form that group is probably critically important. Sometimes, uh, as in the case uh, for me with a, a critical sponsor that left, it somehow had a huge influence in advancing a policy in a particular way. So thinking about the folks that are in your group and the construction of the team and the staging and the timing. Uh, and maybe you want to begin slow with a departmental perspective and then grow. It was actually helpful um, in the York context that um, the libraries had an open access policy and our Osgood Hall Library, had, uh, Osgood Hall Law School had an open access policy so we could, we could showcase other examples of open in our context. Um, and the importance to really think about institutional values as they are identified in your various uh, university documents because that is your pathway to advance the policy. Um, over and over again, we've heard that. We, we know that we've all had to align our work with an academic plan. Um, so when I started at, at York, I felt it was very important as a first step, and it just so happened we were revising our academic plan when I began to get some open access language in the main academic plan or strategic plan. And sometimes that is enough, because once you've got some open access policy in a critical strategic plan or university document or a research uh, plan, then every other faculty and department aligns with that. It can give you a huge push in advancing your policy wherever you are. Uh, next slide, please. And so these are some questions um, that I thought might be useful for you as you were thinking about uh, advancing an open access policy, to think about what the conditions are on your campus or department to, to consider taking a next step. Uh, what are some next steps that, that, that you would consider uh, where you are currently and where your institutions are? I, I just 
feel strongly about meeting people where they are in this discussion and, and to listen very carefully to the faculty who are very nervous about open access because you'll learn a lot from those folks. And so meeting them where they are and being open to listening and hearing the conversation I think is critical. Uh, identifying ahead of time any obstacles facing you and what you need to do to overcome them. Um, and then to never forget about um, the assessment. Um, how do you know what you're doing is working so that, that you can document that, log that, um, consider that for your practice. Uh, and then to, to not forget about the pathway to sustain the momentum after policy is passed. Um, over and over again, I've heard from many, many institutions, as I said earlier, that that momentum sometimes got lost. So think about that too, early on, as you're building out your policy. Um, so I'm going to now move to the best part, I think, which is our lessons learned and invite our, our panel to uh, speak. And so once again, uh, the lessons learned panel is, uh, I'll say a few words, but mostly hand it over to Mark and Diane to share their experiences and lessons learned. Um, we wanted each of them to each of us to start with um, some context about your institution. So the uh, participants, the viewers here could uh, uh, understand where they were coming from. Uh, and a few questions about big tech takeaways and lessons learned um, are, are, I think are gonna be very valuable to all of us. And then we'll hand it over to share with you and see if you have questions for us or maybe you wanna share some of your experiences for the benefit, benefit all, of all. Um, so next slide, please, please. So I, I'll, I'll begin and then hand it over to, to Mark. Um, I've said quite a lot already, but I guess the biggest lesson for me, so my institution has 55,000 uh, full-time students. It's a, a, a large comprehensive institution in um, Toronto, Northern Toronto with a strong social justice value system um, and um, unionized culture. And so the shaping of the plan and the values and how um, we needed to advance that conversation very much, and I, I would say this is true for most open access policies, needed to definitely be faculty led. And I, I, I um, in this um, iteration of, of the open access policy at this institution, um, we invited more faculty than I had in other working groups. And that's because we felt it was very important for the faculty at the disciplinary level to speak to their own disciplinary group, that they could speak the language of um, their community in a particular way that none of us could. And that was tremendously valuable in this context. Um, I would also say that um, it was also important with our policy that we allowed the ability um, to think, to allow um, at the faculty level for the faculties to use this as a baseline, but to then consider uh, creating their own policy uh, from this baseline so that they could advance the effort in any way that they want, but this would be the baseline institution open institutional open access policy. And finally, the, the biggest takeaway I have, though, is not knowing early enough that there was a um, particular way policies needed to be constructed. <laughs> so you'll see that I put that in some of the lessons learned, like learn early on if there is a particular way a policy needs to be constructed uh, for a Senate approved policy because it changed everything. And midway through, I had to rewrite a lot of the uh, documentation once we learned this is the way the policy needed to be passed. And you'll see in some of the, the toolkit that it even influenced some things that I, that I would have never considered that, they, that we needed to name somebody in the policy um, in a way you didn't have to um, in, others, in other policies I've worked on. So I'm gonna now hand it over to Mark to talk about the Brock Experience, which is the latest Canadian institution that has advanced an open access policy. So congratulations to, to Brock and you, Mark. Over to you. Thanks, Joy. Yeah, I think we're the, the most recent policy in, in Canada. I think by our um, count, it's been, there's, uh, we're the 12th. 
Um, I'm actually, uh, I'll give you some background, but I'm just going to put in the chat box the link to um, our brand, uh, brand new website. Um, and and uh, I'll give credit here to Elizabeth Yates, who I see is in the list. So she's helped, um, she's uh, been very involved in the process and, uh, and also has constructed this website. So, um, uh, so a little bit of background, um, and um, I'll tell you a little bit of a story about how this happened. Um, so Brock uh, University is a comprehensive mid-sized university. Um, it's uh, just under 20,000 students um, in total in St. Catharines, Ontario, Niagara region. Um, and uh, um, I think some of the things that Joy was saying just about the culture, some, similar, some similarities at Brock with a very strong and active uh, Senate and Senate committee structure. Um, which actually was really helped this process actually. Um, and then also a, um, uh, also a strong unionized uh, faculty association. So those are some of the, some of the context there. Um, the genesis of this policy, I, you know, I think of policy, we talk about it as if it's the destination and I, um, I like some of Joy's metaphors. I really think of it as maybe a milestone, but it's about, it's a milestone on a journey that has a long lineage, um, you know, coming to that point, but also afterwards. And so um, it's, uh, I would say probably where this came from um, uh, was a, there was in 2015, there was Senate, the Senate um, uh, established an ad hoc Senate committee on scholarly publishing. Um, and that was a, a, a body that um, ran for two years and, its mandate was to look at a long-term plan for Brock University to move towards the um, more appropriate methods of scholarly dissemination. The reason why that happened at that time is because there had, around 2014, there were a lot of uh, discussions around um, pressures on library budget and big deals. Um, and, um, and so there was a kind of a, uh, and a kind of rude awakening about those some of those things and it, it became a discussion at Senate um, and so that uh, that group was established so I, I came in the middle of that um, it, that uh, that um, uh, ad hoc committee it was a two-year long process but it produced a report and recommendations that were endorsed by Senate in, in May 2017 and one of the recommendations was that the Senate Research and Scholarship Policy Committee develop an open access policy and or statement appropriate to Brock University. Um, so what was really key in this, this statement was that it be appropriate to Brock University. So all the things that um, Joy has been saying around the, the importance of context and, um, and that it respond to, to the, you know, the culture that you have in the organization, um, your local context. Um, so fast forward a year and this commit this recommendation was taken up um, by the Senate Committee Research and Scholarship Policy um, and it's kind of a funny story because when it uh, I was on that committee and the chair of Senate happened to be on it as well and we took up the recommendation and sort of discussing it and within I think in that first meeting um, uh, the chair passed the chair of Senate passed a motion that just went right through research and scholarship policy that the university librarian just write a policy and bring it back to the committee uh, for consideration. Um, so that was a very awkward moment for me. <laughs> uh, I felt there was, it was a bit of a dilemma because um, uh, um, my con I had several concerns, three really that, uh, that the task was really supposed to be developing a policy or statement appropriate to Brock, not one that that was one that you know just coming from me it really needed to be the um, result of a process and um, and uh, I think also my concern was that a policy conceived in that way would be seen as a proposal of the library or the administration rather than being seen as a ri arising from from faculty interests so what I did is I for the subsequent meeting I did write a policy um, uh, it was a Harvard style rights retention policy, um, but I prefaced it with a long memo saying why I didn't think it was a good idea that they should just go and approve it. Um, <laughs> and instead I proposed 
that we establish a working group to undertake consultations with the faculties um, and other units on open access policy options and that um, that also such a group should have significant faculty leadership and participation. Um, so uh, thankfully they supported that course of action and they they didn't just rubber stamp that um, policy. I was pretty sure that the policy I wrote would die a very quick death at Senate if it didn't have some very robust process behind it. So that led to an establishment of this uh, open access policy working group um, that conducted its work over two years in uh, two different phases. The first year was consultations. We, um, the committee basically um, uh, sort of uh, identified a couple different pathways or options of um, what policies can look like. And then what we did is we consulted without making a recommendation on which one to go with. We consulted very broadly. Um, uh, and I think we did 13 consultations. So many with faculties, but also with um, um, the Office of Research Services and the Faculty Association and the deans. Um, so we did uh, many. Um, and that was year one. And that that gave us a kind of sense of the environment, um, what people might be prepared for. Um, but the other thing that it did is it really kind of, it, it sort of flushed out all of the red herrings. I don't know if that's the right metaphor, but you know what I mean? It was, it was a way of kind of surfacing all of the things and being able to then construct a policy that avoided the real hot, the real um, kind of uh, hot button issues um, that we knew that, um, it would it would uh, probably die on. And so um, we then the second year took what all of the um, the findings from that that those consultations and then drafted a policy um, that went to the Senate committee and then on to, to Senate. And it just passed on May 27th, um, this uh, less than a month ago. Um, I can't really speak a whole lot about, um, you know, the journey of implementation because we're really very early in that. Um, you'll see the website we've got. It's got an opt-out form and a number of things there. Um, I'll just, you can look at the policy yourself. I'll say it focuses on deposit for us with a, a culture very, that's very um, committed to uh, um, academic freedom. Um, there was concern about policy that would address, that would um, talk about open access publishing. So we focused on dissemination through the repository um, and the, um, the, the kind of um, high level is that Brock scholars are expected to deposit in the repository. However, there is an opt-out form for those who can't for various reasons. Um, and that's a, partly a one, one way for us to learn about um, what kind of obstacles people might be facing in terms of uh, deposit. Um, just in terms of some takeaways, uh, I think they emerge organically from the story. I think the process really is, 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 is as important or more important than the, the product. Um, now that we have the policy, we know that there are lots of people who don't know about it. And now there's going to be another journey of um, communicating it and, um, and sharing it. Um, I think taking it slow is very important as well. Um, not to rush to approval because um, it feels a little bit like a Hail Mary pass at Senate. I'm not, I feel, I'm not one who wants to just uh, take a huge risk at Senate. I feel sometimes that can backfire um, and set you back. And so instead we really took the time, we slowed down the process um, to really have the conversations. Um, faculty leadership on the working group was very important. Um, and then the other, I think we've heard this, is the importance that the, the policy reflect the institution, that it be something that the, the institution sees as being tailored to their needs. We did use the, um, the uh, toolkit. Um, in fact, um, Elizabeth Yates and I from Brock were both involved in, in that process of, of drafting. And so it was actually wonderful because we were working kind of those things in parallel and we were uh, sometimes able to use some things from the, the toolkit as it was developed, the template, and um, vice versa. Um, so it was, it was very helpful. Um, that's probably enough. It's probably more than my three minutes, but I'll be happy to answer questions after when, when the time comes. Thank you, Mike. 
Yes, um, I guess a lot of things have been said already, but I'll, I'll just say a few words about the uh, Université de Montréal. It's a big research intensive university, as you know, so um, it, it's, I think it's uh, third in Canada for research funding. There's 45,000 students, but 67,000 with the affiliated school, like engineering and business and a few thousand uh, researchers. Uh, open access was already part when we started in uh, part of the um, strategic plans. There were some, uh, you know, university had signed some declarations, although the, you know, actions don't necessarily follow what, you know, what you put in your strategic plans. It was open access was already when we started a few years ago to work on an open access policy was already uh, there a bit in the, um, university uh, culture like the, the the sharing to the community so how it got started is in 2015 uh, it was the the library advisory committee uh richard dumont was our director at the time he he he, he um proposed to the research committee the university research community to to uh create a group a working group uh to work on uh furthering open access especially maybe looking at having a open access policy and it was important as um uh, other panelists mentioned that it was uh, that it was going to be a faculty led so there was a working group that was uh, created with professors there was students our students are, are really a, a big traction for open access at uh, Université de Montréal uh, people from the a few people from the libraries and um, uh, people from the office of the uh, vice rector research so that group worked on uh, draft discussing an open access policy principles looking at examples and then drafting a policy and uh, as joy and mark mentioned these things take time and sometimes they stall and you loss of momentum and you know you, you pick it up but two years later there was a proposal that was um sent to the research committee and it was discussed and i think also it was rewritten in a policy language which you know took a little bit more time because uh, as Joy mentioned, uh, if you restructure it, then you stumble about uh, on language and how things are said and, and new questions arise. But it it went well. I think it's just that at some points there that you have to be patient because there's momentum that can be lost when people change positions and things happen. And then this is summer over at the university. But finally, it was um, presented uh, to the university assembly, which is not exactly like the Senate, but in some mandates it's uh, similar. And uh, I was extremely surprised because we were very prepared to defend the policy and it went, it was adopted. Uh, the, the discussion was only a few minutes. I mean, the, 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 the push for open access was really there. Um, so it was adopted and that's maybe what's, um, it was adopted in December uh, 2019 and the plan was because there were a few uh, changes that were um, proposed that it would be launched by the university in March and you know what happened with the crisis uh, the COVID crisis uh, it got stalled so now we're sort of waiting to have it launch officially although it is on our website and we have we do have a web section uh, that describes the policy and 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 uh, and uh, FAQ and all the information about it. And things I wanted to say is on our uh, working group, the working group I mentioned, we had uh, Vincent Larivière, who's from the, the Information Science School at Université Montréal. He's um, a very uh, good speaker, a lot of knowledge. He's a specialist of uh, bibliometry, but also open access. So he's very convincing. Uh, champion for open access. So he was also the one who uh, presented the policy at the, the, the um, uh, University Assembly. There's all, we also had Jean-Claude Guédon, who's another professor at Université Montréal, who's a pioneer in open access, uh, not only in Canada, but in the world. He opened the first open access journal in 1991, electronic journal. So, and we had very, as I mentioned, um, a uh, strong push from students who had published a report on open access and we're pushing the, the university to go in that direction even before we started our work so that was very uh, positive help uh, to get uh, the, the the policy going um, what i wanted to mention that was that uh, in terms of implementation as i mentioned we're, we're sort of waiting but we're we're prepared um, 
it was adopted to, uh, with a few changes. I think what, what is, I guess, uh, maybe original uh, is that people wanted to go uh, beyond what was done at the, with the Tri-Council or Harvard policy because they said it's almost already 10 years later. Maybe we can, at this point, we can do better. So they, the, uh, the, um, in terms of documents covered, people have to submit not only journal articles, but uh, book chapters. So that's included in the policy. And people from the professors from uh, humanities and social sciences, we're really proud um, to have this included because it sort of recognizes that, you know, book chapters are an important contribution to scholarship. Also, uh, other categories of authors were in, are included in the policy. So not only professors, but lecturers, students, postdocs, um, and uh, even, I, I thought it was an interesting anecdote because it's not because they were excluded, but in the, the original draft, the um, research professionals were not included as being subject to the policy. And at the uh, university assembly, when the policy was presented, that group reacted and they, they were a little bit vexed not to be included as being subject to the policy. So they were added. So, so I thought that was a very positive sign when you want to be, uh, you know, uh, have to, subject to a policy is that it, it, it means that you, you value what it, it stands for. Um, what, if I, if there's a takeaway or a lesson and not to repeat what we, we put in the, in the toolkit on the Carl took toolkit. I was thinking that it's probably start ambitious, but be realistic so that it goes through because it's better and more modest policy than no policy at all. And I think it was mentioned before, you need to get that train, uh, leave the station, and then you can improve on after and you know, lead other initiatives in open access. But if you, if you get stuck at the train station, nothing will happen. So we did start uh, more ambitious, including other categories of authors, other t document types, but there were things that we had to, at the end, um, be realistic. And uh, the, the unconditional opting out is one. And I think that's mentioned often in, in, uh, in open access policy. Another thing is, and some people were disappointed, but I think it's realistic. Many are not too comfortable negotiating with editors or going against ed, uh, publishers' policies. So we do have something that says we can res we can um, respect an embar embargo of up to 12 months, as is the case in the tri-council policy. But when we started, people wanted you know right away like immediate open access. But in the policy, we did put that uh, it can be 12 months uh, embargo. Um, apart from that, I'm just checking to see if there's um, something I wanted to mention. No, I think I'll, I'll leave space for questions and I have other things I, I can mention if, um, if uh, there, are, there are some interests, but I'll, I'll leave it at that seeing the time. Thanks. Thank you, Diane. I think your point about when, how to be ambitious, and I think for all of us, we usually start very ambitious and by the time you have many conversations, it becomes what can be accepted, right? Mm -hmm. We end up in a, in a middle place somehow. So that's a, a good point to consider. So there's a question um, from Victoria. Is there, is the way a policy constructed particular to each institution or is there a general way to do it? Um, I would say from my perspective, Victoria, that um, uh, it was a little bit surprising that the policy needed to be constructed the way it was. So th that is the lesson learned I'm sharing with you, that at some institutions, there's a particular way to construct any Senate policy. Um, other open access policies don't go through Senate, so they might not have the same uh, requirements. But in general, I think what we shared in the toolkit is what many policies look like. If you look at many policies, they look like um, what we are sharing in the toolkit. Um, there's also a question for you. Diane, um, from Michael. I don't know if you see it in the chat. Oh, I haven't. No, I'm not in there. Um, I vaguely remember uh, University of Montreal discussing that for professors, publications to be considered for tenure um, mm. transfers that they had to deposit them in the pirates. I think we often hear in the North American context, the example of Harvard because it would, and MIT, the first you know, North American policies. But in, um, 
University of Montreal, there's, there's a lot of references to the Université de Liège, which has a different model, and it's a top-down model. It's, uh, it's the university said, well, you know, we'll only assess uh, publication in assessing um, researchers, their research, we'll only take into account publications that are in the institutional repository. So once you say that, I mean, everybody will put their stuff in the repository. But it, it's a very top-down uh, policy, so it's, it, 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 it's, and I think what Michael refers to is that we often refer to that in our discussions, and of course, it's a, it's a very simple policy, and you, you know, and, and appealing, but it would not have worked at in the uh, universe in the context. And I think it's not just University of Montreal, but in a lot of university cultures, the top down um, approach doesn't uh, really fly. Um, so it, it's, it's not something that that uh, that happened. Okay. Uh, are there any questions? I'm sorry to say we only have a couple of minutes. Or comments from others. Uh, what we, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say it's just maybe pushing a point you already said, but it's it it, it shifts the uh, once you have a policy, even though you know we won't be 100% compliance or you will have to do a lot of promotion, it just uh, sets the default to open access. So what is socially acceptable is disseminating your work in open access. So it does change things, and it you know and it 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 really um, uh, for the change of culture. So for professors. Yes, you, you can opt out unconditionally, but you still have to opt out. So I, I think it, it, uh, it's, it's a very positive move as, as making open access uh, sort of the sociable, socially acceptable uh, position. Thank you, Diane. Wise words. Uh, are there any other questions, ladies, that you can see? Uh, no, and I fear that we are really at the top of the hour already. Are uh, and I'm sorry about that. But uh, I, you know, to to what Mark said earlier, it might be very interesting to come back a year later and do an implementation <laughs> lessons learned from implementation, uh, because that is a whole other conversation, I think. And I hope some of you um, share some of your experiences at some other stage. Um, thank you all very much for attending this presentation. We'd love to hear from you about um, what you think of the toolkit, things that you would like to see in the toolkit, um, even your experience using it. I think that would be tremendously helpful to us as we begin to evolve the toolkit. Um, so Lise, any final words from you? Well, I was just going to thank all of our presenters and panelists from today. Thanks so much for- Thanks to you. Time to, uh, join us and share your experiences with all of us. Yes, thank you. Us. Thanks everyone. Thanks for joining us. Thank everyone.